and Puma had to make up his mind which way he was going. And I didn't have to make up my mind as to which way I was going at all. So we we went our different way. But he 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 remained as head of state. You know, I didn't worry about that. I knew that when Puma was not a man who wanted to be head of state. It was that if you were head of state to go further you had to tackle the financial power of the imperialists and if he didn't, well that was okay with me. That wasn't a slight thing. I never thought of him Puma as a body who wanted power and to sit in the seats of power who would sell everything. That was not my view. I knew him pretty well. He wasn't that type. But he shied away from that head on clash with imperialism, which I understood. And went my way left him alone. Well, CLR James was, just on background, was arguably the most influential intellectual produced by the Caribbean in the 20th century. He was born at the dawn of the 20th century, and his life story, which ends in 1989, but actually, despite his physical death, his story still continues. To the, into the 21st century. His life story is like an arc across the Caribbean that embraces Caribbean nationalism, Pan-Africanism. It embraces and created, in many ways, what in the United States is known as cultural studies. And it embraces revolutionary social theory, Marxism and neo-Marxism that emerges in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, C.L.R. James's the breadth of his intellectual accomplishment it was extraordinary and in many ways links him with uh, another great social and historical theorist, William Edward Burkhard Du Bois. And James should be understood as a kind of intellectual giant similar to Du Bois for the accomplishments that his work represent. Black Jacobins was the first work I read by James. And for me, it stands with Black Reconstruction, and which was produced several years before Black Jacobins uh, appeared in 1935. Uh, Black, Je uh, Black Reconstruction was uh, published. James's work comes three years later. Then six years later, Eric Williams's work, Capitalism and Slavery, is produced. I always think of those three books as a triad of historical and sociological criticism in the black intellectual tradition that are foundational texts because they were produced in the context of the Great Depression and World War II and they represent a political economy argument about the nature of both colonial and post-colonial societies and the role of black labor in producing the wealth of the West and in different ways. So Eric Williams' book shows that capitalism in Europe was found, was spawned from the exploitation of black bodies. James's work shows, documents the only successful slave revolution in world history. Du Bois Black Reconstruction shows the efforts by the former slaves to create a democratic society in the formerly slave-holding South. It was a magnificent failure, but it was a failure and that that reform was unsuccessful to consolidate itself. Very much like Haiti 
Saint Domingue uh, was a magnificent failure in the sense that uh, Dessalines and Christophe after him were unable to, to overcome the blockade that surrounded the island that the West, that first France and then the rest of the, of the United States threw up to keep the virus of black freedom outside of slaveholding territories. They couldn't overcome it. And so Haiti's underdevelopment since was a product of a two century long blockade of capital and wealth and investment out of the island. And that the blacks who struggled for freedom and want freedom were unable to consolidate a stable state. Yes. And of course, Du Bois will remind us of the magnificent success in the campaign for publicly funded education as part of black reconstruction, which was opposed more by even poor whites than they opposed black land holding rights. Right. But today is enjoyed more by uh, working class white people than right. by African Americans, right. as you told us at the in that is right. Indiana University of Pennsylvania when That's you right. gave a lecture there. That's interest, right. Interest. That is that, that uh, uh, public education in the United States is a product, in the South, is a product of blacks, black initiative. That the idea of state investments in, in uh, schools, in roads, in canals, is really an African-American intervention in the southern states. That what blacks wanted was not a wholesale uh, taking away of the land of the former ruling class. They were against them. And in fact, if anything, blacks made a critical error by being far too mild and not being punitive against the former ruling class. And James makes a similar point in Haiti that uh, Toussaint Louverture was not a vindictive man and sought to, um, uh, to curb the excesses of blacks who sought revenge. And James makes the point, revenge has no place in politics. It's a famous sentence in Black Jacobins that had a profound influence on me when I read it. Yes. And in part it has guided my political career and practice. That is, politics, successful politics, must be above petty, partisan personality. Beyond black and white. That is right. We <laughs> must understand that uh, what is objectively, what is objective politically to achieve, we have to separate our personal opinions and whatever petty grievances we have to the side to grasp the larger whole. This is James's point. And the greatness of Toussaint was his ability to do that. And the failure of Dessalines in killing off the whites and then calling an amnesty and the other whites come out and then he killed them. The tragedy, James says, was not for the whites because he, James pointed out we should not set, shed a single tear or a single drop of ink. The tragedy was for the blacks. And because by having a punitive policy toward the whites that it in effect dried up in capital investment in the island and it made it economically impossible to have a functioning society that was stable and that was the tragedy of Haiti hmm. and James makes all of these kinds of philosophical asides and points as well as providing a very detailed sociological roadmap of the nature of Haiti, Haitian society in the early 1790s, 1791, on the eve of the revolution, and then charts and shows how these layers of society, the blacks, the coloreds, the mulattos, and the whites, were fraught with tensions that produced different types of political behaviors and politics in this very small but very important nation of Haiti. So it's a richly told story. It is beautifully written, yes. almost intoxicatingly so. James's ability and command of language 
was for me when I first read the book, extraordinary. Yes. It was mind blowing. Um, I had never seen anybody quite use language the way he did. And it is a remarkable achievement. It's a remarkable book. And a book that is still, despite all the passage of time, is foundational to an understanding, not just of Haiti, but to the dynamics of underdevelopment and the struggle for freedom throughout the Caribbean. And South Africa. And South Africa, that's, that's true. Yeah. Right? He wrote a uh, afterword to the more recent edition where he made that link more clearly. Yes. Interesting right. work. Yes. Right. I wonder if his emphasis in later life, in his later work on education, education, education as the most important way to uplift the suffering people, yeah. uh, drew some lessons from the critique that he was making of uh, the Haitian Revolution. Yes that the bitterness could have been invested in educating the people yes. and equipping them the way Du Bois said that it, right. the founding of public education that's was. Right. No, that's right. Uh, in the United States, there were two demands that the former slaves had in 1865 over any others, land and learning. Yes. Land and learning. So how come people now that say... It did not happen yes. in Haiti. How come people now say that learning is white, or <laughs> well, <it's, laughs> some young people do? It's just incorrect. Yes. I mean, because knowledge is power. Yes. To be knowledgeable is to be empowered. Yes. I think that what happened with Nello, with James, was that he witnessed in in, in the you know the 1960 whatever it was the subsequent issue of. Uh, Black Jacobins in 62, thereabouts, I believe. He's summing up, he has an afterword, and he reflects on revolutionary theory in the Caribbean from Toussaint to Fidel Castro. And he makes a point about the Cuban Revolution. And what the first, one of the first things that Castro did was send thousands of cadres of the you know, 26th of July movement into the countryside in 1960. And they had a mass education campaign. Because you cannot lead a revolutionary society. People can't read and write. How are you going to reach them? And so literacy was a political necessity because you needed a literate society in order to be a society that could be exchange political ideas in an informed way. And the architects in the United States of Black Reconstruction basic, implicitly understood this, that black sharecroppers had to be able to read and write, not to be cheated, mm -hmm. that they, their children had to read and write to advance in the world of work, whether they're manual uh, workers or bricklayers or carpenters or plumbers. Reading and writing was essential. But back on James, um, after Black Jacobins, uh, he wrote A History of Negro Revolt in 1939. And again, this is really a kind of text that is uh, extremely important because he's showing examples of black revolutionary and black protest activity that is transnational. And it is Pan-African. And it is essentially a kind of text that forms theoretical bases for what happens in Manchester in 1945 with the Fifth Pan-African Congress, which is organized by Malcolm Nurse, better known as George Padmore, who was a boyhood friend of CLR James. Padmore uh, had an interpretation of Pan-Africanism which was juxtaposed in oppositional to communism, in part because he himself had been a former communist. James's Pan-Africanism was a part of a revolutionary, Mar independent Marxist project. As you know, James had been a member of the, of the uh, Trotskyist parties yes. in Europe. 
Uh, in the United States, it's called the Socialist Workers' Party. Yes. He had had dialogues with Trotsky in Coyoacan, Mexico, outside of Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And those dialogues were very important in helping to frame the Trotskyist global response to the Negro, what was then called the Negro question. James believed that blacks in the United States would be, and he spells this out really in the late 1940s and in a work on America that was never published but has recently been organized as a volume by Anna Grimshaw. Yes. He believed that black Americans were the vanguard of a re any kind of revolution that could occur in the United States. Blacks were central to it. And they were central to it not because black people genetically or culturally are superior to anybody or inferior to anybody. It's because of our history. The historical circumstances that produced African American life and society, the social the sociology of blackness in America, our objective situation relative to others and within the political economy, and the fact that we are overwhelmingly urban, as he pointed out, places us in a, in a context where any unified movement by that population shifts everything else. And so that if black people get their act together and move collectively, millions of people, in a certain direction, the rest of the society built on top of it, moves with it, or reacts to it, or against it. But James was the first person to understand the centrality of African Americans to any possibility of fundamental democratic or revolutionary change in the United States. And he, he spells this out clearly in his works, especially in the 1940s and in the early 1950s in this manuscript on America. American Civilization. That's right, American Civilization. Yes. So James was an extraordinary social theorist as he reflected upon the lived experience of people's daily lives. What James does is not abstract theory. He actually looks at and analyzes the unfolding, unpacking of society as it is. And he crafts social theory in the light of real life experience of people. You know, Marx said that, you know, ultimately, what Marxism should, well, Lenin said, Marxism should be a concrete analysis of concrete conditions, which means that not something in somebody's head or that's abstract, but drawn from real life material in the real world and framed in a language people can understand. James does that in his analysis of society, and it shines through. Um, the, the prose and the writings of, by James can be very dense if you read his philosophical um, treatise on uh, Hegel, Hegel yes. 1948, mm -hmm. but he also has the capacity to write in a very clear and beautiful prose mm -hmm. that anyone can read and understand. True. And so he has different kinds of writing for different types of philosophical or political interventions. Yes. So I came to admire, deeply admire, the writing of James as well as the content and the critique of his radical democratic ideas. That's interesting um, that you mentioned the notes on dialectics because I was going to come to it. Yes. Do you think that he could be critiqued on the ground that he was too uh, Crazy, or he was praising Hegel too much. The it's maestro says, the maestro at his best. Whereas Hegel is quite notorious in his relationship to people of African descent. That's for sure. And yeah. and yeah. CLR himself is very critical of the, his closest comrades, 
including Trotsky, including Nkrumah, including yeah. Walter Rodney. He right. is very a, a, a severe critique, but when it came to Hegel, he treated Hegel with kids' clothes. Yes. Why was that? Uh, well, when I say that I admire, deeply admire and respect C.L.R. James, that doesn't mean that I, that I agree with everything that he wrote. You know, uh, I love Du Bois, and many people would call me a Du Boisite. Yes. Uh, more than anyone else, Du Bois has influenced my thought. Yes. But I don't agree with everything Du Bois wrote, or of did, or of said. Of course. Same thing is true with CLR James. Mm -hmm. That I think that it's work that emphasizes the power of ideas and does not adequately critique the limitations of the Hegelian dialectic, and also Hegel's interventions on issues of, of race mm -hmm. and Africa, uh, because he was a white racist product of the early 19th century. Yes. If you read of Lordship and Bondage, mm -hmm. I believe 1816 by Hegel, mm -hmm. uh, that was critiqued by, by Franz Fanon, Black Skin, yes. White Masks, yes. in a thorough way. Yes. And Hegel said that what the slave, the master seeks is recognition. Mm -hmm. And um, Fanon's rejoinder was, no, what the master seeks is work, unpaid labor. Mm -hmm. He doesn't seek the recognition of his, of his slave. What he seeks is to beat the slave, to extract his labor power, mm -hmm. to brutally exploit him. True. I think Fanon was closer to the mark than Hegel. So, you know, the reason that Nello did that is because he's writing in 19, the late 40s and Stalinism was at its height yes. and that Marxism had degenerated in the Soviet Union to a kind of vulgar economism and devoid of the dialectical flow that is really the heart of what Marx had in mind as Marxism. And so, you know, at that time, I'm not sure if Lukács's, uh, you know, uh, histo history and class consciousness was available to to CLR, uh, or the work of other, and certainly not the work of Antonio Gramsci. But these, uh, one could say, revolutionary historical idealists that emphasize, as Gramsci put it war of position as well as the war of maneuver, the emphasis on ideology. This is what one sees in James's philosophical notebooks. Mm -hmm. And the overemphasis and the kid glove approach on Hegel is really a kind of reaction to the very heavy-handed economic determinism in the coarse social care theory of the Stalinist mark, uh, communist at yes. that time. Yes. So you have to keep in mind why he's writing what he does, yes. because that's the context. He's reacting to that. Yes. I, I think it was a critique of uh, Trotsky from beginning to end. Yes. Notes on dialect is that that's right. Trotsky got uh, right. the interpretation of the Russian Revolution wrong. Wrong, right. That it had gone wrong, but Trotsky was still defending it. Right. Yeah. And that James wants to make a break from the Stalinist model. Yes. And he also is espousing a theory of socialism that essentially is a kind of participatory democracy from below. Yes, that's something that struck me in his uh, notes on dialect. It's from the opening page and repeatedly through the text. He's talking about the dissolution of the party as an agency, right. uh, but to return to spontaneity. Right, he's against uh, the theory of the vanguard party. Yes. And uh, in effect, it makes a break from Leninist thought mm -hmm. and says that what we need is to learn from the masses, that the masses have the capacity independent of the party. Yes, I think he is right on the money because uh, Toussaint did not form a party. Yes. Martin did not form a party. Yes. Malcolm did not form a party. This is <laughs> and true. all the way down to Bob Marley, to well, people like us who are teaching in universities. Well. Although, <laughs> although, you know, I, I, I met with Nello okay. in 1986. Yes. I went to his home, his flat. In London. In London, that's right, in, in Brixton. 
mm -hmm. Fort Lambert. Mm -hmm. And um, this is one of the things we argued about. Okay. That I felt that there was too much Rosa Luxemburg okay. in, in Mello mm -hmm. on this theory uh, that you could liquidate the party, that, that you need some kind of coherent mechanism, especially in the environment of severe repression, okay. say in South Africa. Yes. yes. You had to have, after 61 in Sharpeville, mm -hmm. they formed the MK. Mm -hmm. Uh, the spirit of the nation. I put it on they the had head. to go. They had to go underground. Yes. And a lot of their cadre were also members of the South African Communist Party. Yes. And the ANC arguably would have disintegrated mm -hmm. without the the fierce and loyal support of the South African Communist yes. Party yes. to keep it together, mm -hmm. because the communists had already had a, a decade of being banned by the apartheid, apartheid regime. And the apartheid regime uh, intended to destroy the ANC so that you could not rely on spontaneity unless the environment allowed for mass participatory struggle. But if the state was was sufficiently repressive. It, it you know we have seen many examples, say China in 1989, mm. where you have millions of people unorganized uh, who were unorganized who took to the streets, mm. and the party and the military crushed, crushed them. Yeah. That's, crushed. That's a critique of uh, Fanon against spontaneity and right. in favor of uh, discipline. It's some kind of discipline structure. Yes. So Nello began to cough. Oh yeah. And he didn't like that <laughs> argument. Okay. You know, and I said, look, you know, politically, I, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a communist. I'm a democratic socialist. Okay. I believe in democratic revolutions. I was highly critical of the Bernard Core tendency in the New Jewel movement, mm. and I think it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. to overthrow, uh, you know, the new jewel mm -hmm. and uh, Maurice Bishop. Yes. So I'm not sympathetic toward that kind of Stalinist definition of, of, of communism. Mm -hmm. That's a theory of totalitarian uh, rule and oppression. Mm -hmm. So be clear on that. Yes. <laughs> but... <laughs> There is a necessity at mo in historical moments to have clandestine organizations and mass spontaneity is no substitute for that. It all depends on the historical moment. Yes. So Nello still didn't react very well to it, but we had a lively discussion. Thank you. We had a very lively discussion. What is that in your book? The uh, Pan I, I'm not sure if I've ever written about no. that, okay. but it's, oh, wow. but it, but it's We're true. getting a scoop here. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, you know, the other thing that Nello said in 1986 to me that did have, that I have written about, that had a powerful impact on me in my subsequent writing, is that I asked him, do you have any regrets about your own writing? Do you have any regrets? He said, yes. He said, I wish that from the very beginning of my career, I wrote with clarity and wrote with um, the need to communicate to a very broad audience that he felt from the time he was in his early 50s throughout the rest of his career. If you look, if you read Nello's work carefully, there is a shift in tone and in style in his writing. The same thing is true with, my, with mine. You know, sometimes I look back at earlier works like How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America yes. and, um, you know, or Blackwater, and I cringe because of the style. It's too heavy-handed, heavy, heavy -handed, it's too polemical, and it's too narrow. And if you look at my work 
since about since the early 90s. The color lines. Well, yeah, That's since the early 90s, but especially actually since the late 90s. If you look at uh, the Great Wells of Democracy, or if you look at black, if you look at uh, uh, what had now has been my best received work, which is Living Black History. People love the book, and a lot of people have purchased it, and they love it. Living Black History and the Great Wells of Democracy, the meaning of race in American life, are interventions that are designed for a mass audience that where I try to reach as many people as possible. If you read Beyond the Boundary, mm -hmm. he's writing for a mass audience. Yes. He's trying to reach as many people as possible, mm -hmm. and yet he does have rich theoretical sophistication. Mm -hmm. But he is not writing for a narrow group of Trotskyist mm -hmm. sectarians. Yes. It is not a polemical uh, uh, argument that uh, you know characterizes his debates in the Fourth International, mm. and he makes a break in how he conceived writing as a type of political intervention, and so that his later work is written in a very different style, and it's a style that I now have embraced and characterizes my own. So would you advise sociologists to communicate and to perform less on the page? <laughs> I would say sociology especially it has a writing style that normative sources sociology is turgid and not so much dogmatic but driven by empirical research and very little social theory. Mm -hmm. The sociological imagination. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's lacking in a sociological imagination. That's the strength of James. Yes. His ability to dissect society as it is, but then to theorize from the lived experience. Mm -hmm. Sociology should be theory plus history. Yes. yes. Both. Yes. It is a historically grounded analysis. It, is, it should be a concrete analysis concrete conditions, but it also must theorized from that lived experience, which requires imagination, intuition. It requires a critical eye. And that is where sociology, at its, as it is taught, is very weak, mm. at least here in the United States. Yeah, it is global. Okay. It's a global weakness. Yes. Um, that is the weakness. And James, James is really basically is corrective to that. Mm. If you read Beyond the Boundary, yes. this is a book that is that takes a metaphor of cricket and on its face it's simply a book about the history of cricket in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. But it's much more so because within that boundary and the contestations of it really speak to the stratified nature of Caribbean society, of the browns, the blacks, the whites, how the society functions, how people use that game as a site of contestation, which redounds within the totality of society. This is James's point. Mm -hmm. And so that is within these boundaries that we learn the nature of what struggle is for the birthing of a Caribbean identity and uh, the nucleus of what becomes uh, a demand for independence. Yes. A demand for independence. Yes. Through, you know, through uh, this, this prism of, of these games mm -hmm. that people play but do have real content and, and profound social meaning. Not unlike, say, heavyweight boxing in the United States, from Jack Johnson to Joe Lewis to Muhammad Ali, that the heavyweight champion for much of the 20th century in the United States was the symbol of masculinity and a symbol of power. And for the black man to control that symbol had profound implications for the racial hierarchy throughout the society. So James makes a similar point about the centrality of cricket 
in the British Caribbean and the nature of that game to the makeup of the society and the contested struggles within that society. Mm -hmm. And it's a brilliant argument. It is. And it, it's remarkably well written. It is. Yes. It is. Uh, but is it possible to argue that he gave too much credit to cricket in the social structuration of Caribbean society and little, not enough cri well, credit? Well, he, he is writing from the point of view of the British Caribbean. Yes, but there is cricket in Britain, but the British are not as well behaved in terms of their no. magnanimity to people who are less fortunate than them. Right. And uh, James is saying that this is something that cricket gave to the Caribbean. Yes, right. That even when you win, you don't brag. Right. But where did uh, Winston Churchill get all his bragging from? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the British were also influenced by other types of games. Yes, yes. And that... Um, blood sport. Uh, yes, uh, more blood sport. Yeah. But the more polite games of cricket took hold more firmly mm -hmm. and the colonials learned the lessons better both in the West Indies as well as in Pakistan, India, mm -hmm. Salah and other parts of the realm, the British Empire. Yeah, but it could it be suggested that the civility that James attributed to cricket was partially the legacy of African civilization in the Caribbean, that Africans tend to be differential towards especially the elderly that could be i would entertain that that's a possible that's a possible interpretation mm -hmm. but james was his some of james's critics argued that he was too deferential to the legacy of british imperialism yes. that he was a profoundly a western intellectual and there's a great truth in that mm -hmm in that James felt a deep sense of indebtedness to the philosophical and cultural traditions of the West. But the way I interpret it, and the way that I tell my talk with my students about James, is that for you to actually overthrow a society, you must know it inside out. Mm. That it is a mistake to take the view that we should not master and learn the great philosophical and literary and cultural text of the West. Because we are here because of the predator, predatory power and the exploitation and ruthlessness of capitalism. Mm -hmm. We are a product of that. African American people were brought here against their will, as were people of African descent in the Caribbean and, and the, throughout the Americas. My great-grandfather, Morris Marable, was sold at the age of nine on an auction block in West Point, Georgia, in 1854. Don't think I don't feel that every day, or reflect critically on the contradiction that my great-grandfather was a piece of property, never compensated for his labor power, or uh, sold away from his mother by the man who was both his owner and his biological father. James felt a great intimacy with the ordeals and struggles of enslaved people of African descent. But he also understood that we are products, too, of Western civilization. And as we critique it, in order to transform power relations in a sociological way, to create a democratic and socialist political economy that benefits the masses of people, we must understand the philosophical and cultural underpinnings of that society and know them well. So we have students today in the United States over the last, say, 30 years that react to the cultural imperialism of the Western civilization text don't want to, you know, be able to identify Picasso painting, or not read Cervantes, mm. or Beowulf, or Chaucer, or John Milton, mm. or Mark Twain, or Faulkner or Hemingway. That's a mistake. Mm. Because we have to, to, in order to critique something, you must first know it. 
sacrifice. That's things. all James is saying. Yes. In order to transform something, mm. we must understand its character and the strengths and weaknesses of it. Mm. Because we would retain the strengths and the positive character and the contributions of the West. And there are many yes. that we would want, seek to maintain. But we must transform the oppressive institutions that exploit and imprison people.